Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the Danube Institute and to this discussion of Germany between the elections and the new government. Is it a case of encore, the same again, or is it a case of new casting um, and new issues? Uh, I, will not going to, I will not attempt to answer these questions myself. Uh, I have a, a panel, a distinguished panel of three experts who will do so, after which we will throw open the question to the floor. Before we do, I just want to make two brief announcements. Um, one is, of course, that you're, um, th this is an event organized by um, the Daniel Institute. Uh, we've now been going for four years. Um, we, we claim to have three broad attitudes which represent the views of the organization, namely, we are classical liberal in economics. We are, oh, I see our dist distinguished uh, president of the um, uh, Boyton Institute, which is our parent institute has arrived. Um, you also held other important positions like that of foreign minister, so welcome uh, to our <laughs> event today. Um, but I just wanted to say that we st stand for classical liberalism in economics, conservatism in culture, and Atlanticism in foreign policy. Um, but above all, we stand for debate. Debate, argument, and discussion. Uh, one of the problems, it seems to us, has been in the past that um, there's been so much partisanship in Central Europe because there hasn't been enough debate, and we want to get debate which brings people together in a one sense while uh, separating them as well. But so welcome to our conference. Um, secondly, the second announcement is at the end of this, uh, at the end of the discussion, um, we are going to be throwing a small party. This will not be the Danube Institute's party, it's uh, the food and the drink will be provided um, by uh, Total Consulting um, Incorporated, which happens to be my wife's company, and it's marking the fact that tomorrow is the beginning of Lent. So we thought it was reasonable on Fat Tuesday for people to have something to eat and drink. So that's um, at the end of the discussion. I want to also say that, that this particular conference is really the brainchild of my colleague, the director of the Institute, Naomi Karani. I want to thank her for um, the work she's done for it and, and to say that uh, I hope that um, she will in herself be involved in the discussion as we go along. So, so, um, so thank you, Naomi. Now, um, I've already said the topic of the conference, and since I have three experts here who know more about it than I do, um, well, I'm going to invite them each to, to begin with a speech of some, anything between 10 to 15 minutes before we throw open the discussion to the floor. So first of all, I'm going to ask um, uh, Gergely Prule, the, currently the general director of the Potofi Literary Museum, but uh, he, among other things, is married to Noemi, <laughs> but in addition, he is the, um, uh, has had a distinguished career in diplomacy, um, in in um, the arts, uh, uh, in politics, and in the bureaucracy. Um, you, you will see uh, in the program some of the positions he's held, um, but his main field of research uh, is the um, social, political development, and international relations of the German-speaking countries. So he is um, well uh, suited to introduce the, t the topic, and I look forward very much to what he has to say. Gergely. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for the invitation, but I would have a suggestion, if I may, because Mr. Schlie has all the data uh, of, the, of the German elections, and it would be probably better to uh, let him speak first, and, uh, and then we could speak the, about the situation uh, nowadays. Well, I'm perfectly happy. Um, if he's happy with that, I'm perfectly happy with it as well. So, in this case, sorry. As a diplomat, you have always uh, accommodate yourself with new situations, <laughs> and so. Uh, uh, so, uh, well, Professor Chile, I mean, again, you have a distinguished uh, career in uh, diplomacy and the academic aspects of diplomacy as well. I'm not going to again list all of the positions you've held, um, but um, uh, you are a pleasant, you are the chair and founder of the Centre for Diplomacy um, at Andrashi University. So I'm looking forward very much to what you have to say, particularly since, as I now see for myself, you do have all of the data. John, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I wanted to start uh, and say that I'm uh, sandwiched between a um, 
former German, uh, former Hungarian ambassador to Germany and a uh, rising star uh, um, from the analytical scene and observers, close observers of Germany. As of, as a, still a career diplomat um, and an academic, um, my background is history, so we historians tend um, to look at history in longer perspectives than in two-month reaction. Um, I'm tempted, um, <coughs> first of all, to recall Chatham House rules, and um, Secondly, to say that nothing is as difficult as making predictions. Mark Twain is famous for his quote. Uh, he said, never make predictions, especially about the future. However, <laughs> since Adam and Eve left paradise, we live in an age of transition. And if you look at the current situation in, in Germany, the state of limbo is still ongoing. Um, we have thankfully printed out the results of the German elections, which led, you, you have it um, in front of you, is the printout. When you look at the current composition of the German Bundestag, um, you see, first of all, two phenomena which are new. The first is the number of parties present in the German Bundestag. We have actually we have seven parties because Union is composed of the Christian Democrats and the Bavarian sister party of the Christian Democrats, the Christlich Soziale Union. Uh, these are two parties which form one parliamentary group uh, that goes back to the year 1976 and it has been at least discussed this time whether they should form again a parliamentary group in the German Bundestag. So the, the outcome, and that's one of the explanations why we are currently in such a difficult situation, is that coalition government and apart from one singular phase in the 1950s under uh, the chairmanship of Konrad Adenauer, we had coalition governments in the German Bundestag since 1949. Uh, the formation of a coalition government this time is much more difficult uh, than under um, circumstances which have been provided so far. So this is new. We also have for the first time, I'm not very happy to say that. Uh, the right-wing AFD represented in the German Bundestag. And it's, if you look at, from the perspective of a grand coalition with shrinking numbers, is 94 members um, of the AFD in the German Bundestag. That means that the right-wing AFD is stronger than all the other opposition parties, the liberals, uh, the left, and the Greens. So um, this, is the, this is the constellation. Um, what did we see since election day? Uh, we saw the failure of a formation of a Jamaica coalition. That means um, they not even started the negotiations, so um, it was an unsuccessful attempt to bring together the Christian Democrats, the Green Party, and the Liberals in one government. Um, we could go into the details why it came that way. Um, there are several reasons. As always in history, there's not only one singular factor which caused that breakdown. And we had now at least the situation where Christian Democrats and Social Democrats agreed upon a so-called coalition treaty. Uh, the coalition treaty um, has the handwriting more or less 70% of the Social Democrats. Um, and uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel most recently said that um, she gave up several positions, but um, she did that with the clear intention that she wanted to form a government. There is another alternative uh, to which I will come in a minute. It's the perspective of a minority 
government. That brings us to some, um, some aspects of our basic law. Um, uh, but I will come back to that in a minute. So Angela Merkel has given up several positions, but it's at the very moment it's not clear whether the Social Democrats will give their stamp of approval to that coalition government because they will ask their um, party members and so far the signature of, of the coalition, gov uh, coalition treaty has led to um, a state of chaos or turmoil within the Social Democratic Party. Martin Schulz, uh, the rising star of the Social Democrats, in, in, we all should recall that he has been elected with a hundred percent last year. Um, he has now faded away and left already the political uh, stage. Uh, um, the party is now in a leadership contest. It's not clear whether the most likely person to surface from that leadership contest, um, the, now the chairman of the parliamentary group, former member of the government, um, Andrea Nahles, uh, will be uh, the successful uh, person which should come out of that uh, uh, party contest. And when you look at the discussions within the Social Democrats, uh, I think the party suffers from um, several, um, several tendencies. There is a tendency, um, a widespread feeling, that they should leave government and not serve under Angela Merkel. For the first time, Angela Merkel is facing a uh, starting uh, discussion within her own party, the Christian Democrats. Um, um, uh, and for the first time, articles um, appear in German media which imagine a post-Merkel Germany. Uh, so it was a tactical retreat, and the government, which is doomed to be weaker and, and perhaps the most unstable uh, Germany has ever had in decades is the more likely scenario. I call it scenario A. It's a grand coalition with shrinking numbers, um, with tactical compromises. Um, the Social Democrats are, I mentioned that, are in the middle of an existential crisis, and they have large fractions within the party. And that means that this is not the best starting point to form a, a, new, a, a new government which should last for four years. Angela Merkel most recently said in a television interview on Sunday that she would stay four years in office. She has no other alternative than to say so if she wants to avoid questions about her um, leadership uh, capacities. So the situation within the Christian Democrats is also, I, I would call it un, unpredictable. It's not likely that we see a leadership contest which uh, puts into question Angela Merkel's party uh, uh, leadership or her position as chancellor, but the first voices have been addressed which say that at least she should be clear on how to manage um, the debate on her successor. And if you look at the situation, being elected for the fourth time as chancellor, and she is not yet elected uh, in the German Bundestag, I would say this is not a very good starting point. And to answer very briefly the question I've been asked to answer is um, <clears throat> whether we will see more of the same. Everything what I have been elaborating so far is not more of the same because it's something which we haven't seen so far in Germany. But if you expect from a new grand coalition with shrinking numbers, uh, um, a fresh start, uh, a new style, I think it's, it's very likely to say that this is not, predict that this is not even um, really predictable, but, but what I predict is that that will not happen. The other alternative, very quickly, is a minority government. Um, I've distributed Article 63 of our basic law. Um, that means that a minority government could come into being uh, in, 
whether this will be under Angela Merkel or someone else, it's absolutely possible. The person who can chair that minority government must not necessarily be a member of the German Bundestag. It could be someone else. And this minority government could stay in office for um, one year, two years, three years. This is open. It's more likely that a minority government will lead to uh, new general elections. This is at least what Angela Merkel and others have said so far. Um, Angela Merkel is not very keen on uh, that new kind of um, minority government which we never had in, in German politics. And when we look at Angela Merkel, one should take into consideration uh, that against her background um, as someone who started his career in academia, um, um, she is a natural scientist and she's not she is risk averse um, and, and she is risk averse in the sense that um, she uh, is not really open for um, new experiences uh, and this is why uh, she was so reluctant in opening a debate about minority governments i i i i, I beg to differ in 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 that point and others beg to differ as well we had voices from um, leading uh, experts in constitutional law, Matthias Herdigen uh, from Bonn University. We also have members of the German Bundestag. Uh, among them is Jens Spahn. He is uh, one of the um, um, uh, more prominent um, critiques of Angela Merkel and possibly someone who could be represented within the new government of the Grand Coalition. He said that he would prefer a minority government Perhaps we can go back to uh, the debate on what is better for, for Germany. Very briefly and quickly uh, to sum up, what is the perspective of Germany? Um, and perhaps from a Hungarian perspective, um, um, do, do we expect that Germany will act differently from what we have seen in the, in the past? The answer is, uh, is, is yes and no, uh, not in the sense that there will be a new approach to uh, um, general politics, especially in foreign and security policy, which is not very high in the coalition um, treaty. So if, if you look at the positions in foreign and security policy, they are closer to the social democrats than to the Christian democrats. And we see that in a variety of political fields. We see that when we look at labor policy, when we see it, when we look at finance and economy. And I think this is everything what can be said about that coalition treaty that is, is more of the vision of the social democrats than we ever have had in a, a coalition government. And this is remarkable um, because when you look at, at the sheer numbers, you see that the social democrats um, are, um, are fading away and they are now, um, they not even have 20% at the moment in the polls, so um, they are um, roughly about 17 or 18%. So um, the perspective is uh, not very gloomy. Um, and I think, and this is the good news, uh, one should always end with the good news and a good perspective. The first remark is that under the provisions of the German constitution, um, um, there is no reason to um, be afraid of instabilities. There will be a government, I can, I can assure you, and there will be at least an acting government. And um, we, we, we are not going to have, um, if I may set, say, say that under Chatham House rules, um, <coughs> Italian, um, a, 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 a scenario comparable to um, uh, Italian domestic uh, policy. So Germany will remain Germany and act as uh, on the international <coughs> stage. The more interesting side of the prediction is, is what will happen to the party system. The party system is in, 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 in deep turmoil and crisis. Um, uh, I expect that both the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats um, will not gain but lose uh, 
electorate. Um, my fear is that the right-wing party, uh, AFD, will stay on the scene for quite a long period, um, and they are about to take profit from the current situation. Um, the liberals might take profit from the weakness of the Christian Democrats, and the, left, the lefts might take profit from the ongoing discussions in the Social Democrats. I don't expect uh, with the, that with the new uh, chairman of the party, whether be it Andre Annales or someone else, all the discussions within the Social Democrats it will come to a close. So um, there will be many things to write home about, to report, and I can assure that if Tamas Mona is the next speaker, um, and he will have enough to do within the next uh, six or eight months. So um, Germany is still something which can be debated. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I should just say about Chatham House Rules, we are, of course, recording this yeah. and hoping to put it on the Internet. I should say... <laughs> should have I, should, uh, I should say, um, um, uh, in addition, however, yeah. that m my experience of Italian politicians is that they say much more... Uh, s much stronger things about the nature of Italian politics than you just did. I think it doesn't really come into the, it doesn't come into the offensive category. I think um, beginning with Mussolini who said that uh, it wasn't difficult to govern Italians, it was simply futile. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so perhaps uh, we can go on. Um, before I move on to another speaker, perhaps I could just ask one question. And, and, um, and this is something which has mystified me, which is that um, the, the, the failure of the Jamaica coalition arose largely from the fact that the Free Democrats uh, walked out of the discussions. And the Free Democrats said they did so because they felt that they were being offered almost nothing in the negotiations from Mrs. Merkel, and they felt burned by the experience of being in coalition with her last time when, of course, they didn't even reach the, in the following election, they did not even reach the 5% uh, threshold. So my question is, um, what do we think is the likely future for the Free Democrats? Um, if they're going to be one of the two major opposition parties? Well, after the failure of Jamaica, the Free Democrats, the li Liberals have been um, accused uh, um, very harshly that they um, have made a, a tremendous political mistake. I'm not so sure in the long run. When you look at the current mess which we have in German politics, the Liberals might take profit from that. and. Uh, Lindner, he is the strong man of the Liberals, undoubtedly. He will make sure that all those dissatisfied with the uh, current uh, CDU uh, government uh, and with Angela Merkel in person, they will give their uh, vote to the Liberals. Mm -hmm. I, I, the funny thing about the so-called Jamaica negotiation is that they never started real negotiations. They... Um, they not even were successful in bringing, in starting negotiations. And I think this, in my view, and that's my personal view, uh, is, is only the result of a, a tactical mistake, how the process was handled. But that's my, my absolutely my, my personal view on that. Um, on Do that you differ? Yeah. Do you want to come in on that? No, yeah. no, no, yeah. please. Well, so, then, no, I think what we'll now do is move on to the next question, and, and we'll, of course, have a very vigorous debate on this and other questions later. Perhaps I can now turn gurgly to you. I've already introduced you, so go at it. So thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for the good news, uh, Dr. Schried, that Germany remains Germany, and one Germany is also very important. And um, uh, I think we have to go back a little bit and to ask for the... Uh, or to find an answer how the results of this election uh, came that way. And uh, uh, first, which is sometimes um, um, interestingly a new information uh, in Hungary, that the German political system is, um, uh, is a very special one. The, the federal uh, construction uh, is 
very much interested to be much more balanced than, for instance, the Hungarian uh, political system. So um, conflicts are not really welcomed uh, in the German system. And this balanced uh, political uh, culture um, is, from my point of view, one of the main reasons for that, that uh, the, the political parties uh, uh, lost uh, their profile in the last couple of, uh, couple of years. So, um, and for, I think, uh, the, uh, uh, the phenomenon Angela Merkel is not just because uh, her background as a scientist, but also because of the nature of the German political culture. Um, someone who is very much, who is thinking much more in, uh, uh, in real issues, in projects, and not in political ideologies, it's much more welcome in the German system and in the German society uh, than a real uh, politician um, from, from each or the other side. So, I mean, uh, this uh, federal system uh, is very much interested to have and to keep this balance. That's the one thing. And um, the, other, the other point is that in the last couple of years, uh, uh, the development in the German society um, was uh, uh, very much uh, influenced by these different types of, of modernization. Uh, it means that the, the real uh, Christian democratic values, which are uh, based on families, uh, uh, probably religion, uh, Christian uh, uh, values, uh, they have not anymore that importance that they had uh, before. Um, and uh, if we look um, at the, the party programs of the uh, German Christian Democrats, we don't see these values um, anymore. It's a very um, practical, uh, very pragmatic uh, uh, issue in a country which is, um, which is uh, welfare very well known uh, for every uh, member of, uh, of this society. So it's not easy to find the profile uh, for a party, not for the Christian Democrats, but also not for the, for the social Democrats. And uh, for me, the, uh, the uh, result of the uh, negotiations towards uh, the Jamaica coalition was um, a very good example for that, that in, in, in this situation uh, where the parties without this, this clear profile are still uh, very strong, um, the FDP, the liberals, have tried to find uh, a real profile for, for themselves. And to find the profile in a coalition, it's much more complicated to find the profile outside the coalition. So, um, I think that was a very, very well planned uh, action uh, for Mr. Lindner and for, for the FDP uh, party leadership not to uh, build a coalition uh, with uh, Angela Merkel and not uh, with the other parties because they need this new profile, especially in that situation where where, where so many turmoils uh, in the uh, in the German society uh, are present, and we have to speak about the about the phenom phenomenon. Uh, AFD, which is of course linked to the migration uh, issue. And uh, it makes the Hungarian perspective so interesting. Because it was for me a very sad uh, experience in the Chancellor debate between Angela Merkel and Martin Schulz that Hungary was mentioned uh, not less than eight times, ladies and gentlemen, in, the ne in a negative context. So it means uh, that, uh, that for the German political communication, uh, the migration issue uh, is, of course, uh, a very important one. And to find an explanation uh, for the German public for that, what happened to 2015 uh, in Germany, uh, they need a kind of, uh, of enemy 
uh, to, to say against this enemy that was the German politics with his major, uh, uh, nature, uh, with, with his um, very uh, politically uh, developed uh, and, and uh, mature uh, view uh, on the on the world uh, uh, processes, uh, which was able to uh, to make these wise uh, decisions. So uh, it of course it's it's of course a perspective which is from the from the Hungarian perspective um, a very sad one. So uh, my perspective is that um, Germany is a, is a very stable country and the German political system and the German uh, economy is very strong. So um, uh, many things can uh, happen, but this stability is, is, is not uh, in danger. Um, but it's still a very interesting question how the political system will react on uh, these turmoils in the German society how the Christian Democrats can find a new profile in this modernized uh, uh, world, and how the Social Democrats can find a new profile um, in that situation of general welfare. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I mean, I I'm going to now throw one question, if I may, to you, and, and very much rem address to your last remarks. Yes, Germany is a very stable society, and the German political system has been stable for a very long time. But um, aren't there signs uh, in the last election of really quite serious instability? For example, um, the, the CSU, which has always been a fairly tame ally from the outside, it seems, of the CDU, all of a sudden looks as though it's getting wanting to flex its muscles, demonstrate some independence. Of course, it wants to be part of the government, but it wants to demonstrate too that, um, or to blame Mrs. Merkel for the fact that, um, along with the failure, the, the fall in support for the Christian Democrats, there was a fall in support for the CSU as well, and they want to handle that. Do, we, do you see signs that there could be any movement between the parties? Would can one see any sign, for example, that the, um, some of the Christian Democrats might, uh, might want to start a kind of a CSU um, across Germany. In some sense, the, CSU, the fact that there isn't a CSU in Germany as a whole explains some of the problems of the country. I think it's, not, uh, it's simply not possible because the CSU is a regional party and that's, that's uh, you know it much better than I do, that uh, um, to have a um, CSU uh, Germany-wide is simply not possible. So uh, there were some some experiments uh, towards that, but uh, I mean uh, it's much more possible that there will be probably a change. And it was a remark of uh, in an interview uh, of Angela Merkel that um, this concentration on traditional values, this uh, uh, to renew the party, to um, to be more careful with the, the, the ideas of modernization, that, that can be a gesture towards the CSU, but we shouldn't forget that uh, the CSU lost almost 10% um, uh, by the election, and I think it's a very, very clear sign that, uh, that um, to be consequent is uh, one of the most important things in nowadays politics. Because the problem was that um, uh, on, the one, uh, on the one day, uh, Mr. Seehofer tried to ashamed ashamed Angela Merkel to be uh, too weak in the migration issue. But uh, the other day, he told she is the greatest politician uh, ever we had. And, uh, um, uh, and the voters, uh, I can, I can, uh, I'm sure they, they, they thought it's much better to vote for AFD um, in that uh, in that situation because that weakness uh, is something which is uh, which is uh, totally inconsequent in uh, in this in this very crucial situation. Yes, <clears throat> I think two two points. You have made very important remarks on um, a strong sense and need for, um, and willingness in the, German, in the German political culture to have consensus. I think this is one of the recipes of success 
of the German system since 1949. Um, and we see that in Austria you also have a tradition for um, consensus. Uh, uh, but this old system has come to an end now. And you mentioned uh, correctly the migration crisis. And the migration crisis not only has um, given um, 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 a strong push to the uh, right-wing opposition, to the AFD, but the country is split um, uh, in a way uh, I've, I've never seen the Federal Republic of Germany split up. And, and this uh, split and this dissatisfaction, which is a, a, um, a rising um, phenomenon, um, is um, a threat to um, stability and um, a tendency to have a compromise. Uh, your remarks about the CSU are um, quite to the point. There are some weaknesses within which stem from a lack of courage and also from a lack of consistency, I put it in, in a diplomatic way. Um, but um, if the CSU had decided uh, uh, to be present in uh, all over the Federal <coughs> Republic, I, I would not be surprised if they had nearly 20%. But these 20% uh, would mean 10% less from, um, for AFD and 10% less for uh, the uh, Christian Democrats. So, but this is pure speculation for the moment. This is not likely to happen. They still have one parliamentary group in the German Bundestag and um, I don't see a movement that the CSU, uh, that the CDU and CSU will split up. So the question um, um, which brings me back to um, a um, prediction for the future is what does that dissatis dissatisfaction with party politics mean for the future of the German party system? And which are the coalitions uh, which we will see uh, are the most likely uh, coalition. We, we do see some coalitions in the lender uh, where you have uh, Social Democrats, the Green Party, and the left party. Uh, um, the question is, is that an alternative for uh, the Federal Republic? Um, undoubtedly, in, um, in the time of Angela Merkel, she is um, chairman of the party since the year 2000. Um, uh, the Christian Democrats have lost some of their former ingredients. And although um, Helmut Kohl and Konrad Adenauer had also that tendency towards compromise, I think the, the image and the public image, but also the, the, the way the party was ruled in the times um, from 1949 to the year 2000 were much clearer than they are today. You can say that this tendency has to do with the current dissolution of party affiliations. Um, I think the whole, the whole political scenario is changing. Um, and you see phenomena in Austria, in Italy, in, um, in the Czech Republic, in, in everywhere, um, all over Europe, where we will see more and more new parties. And the old party affiliations are fading away. And I think it's a challenge, the current situation is a challenge for the party system and how we deal with uh, political parties. I think we cannot do without political parties. And I think this is one of the challenges we, we have to face and even Hungary, uh, and the question of uh, government and opposition and the party system is something which has to be debated in, in, in this country as well. Thank you. I, I take your point about political parties. They, they exist partly in order to put different packages of policies together that make some sort of coherent sense so that the voters have got something to choose from. Their role is, I think they are in a sense indispensable, but of course people may not feel that always. Um, let me now turn, if I may, to uh, uh, Tamas Malnar, um, who is the researcher at the um, Institute for Foreign Policy and Trade, um, with which, by the way, I'm glad to say we've cooperated on a number of occasions, and we look forward to doing so in future. And um, 
I, and of course, um, um, as already been referred to by Professor Slee, a rising young expert uh, on German po um, on German politics, but also on the politics, I think, of all the Teutonic uh, nations or Middle Europa. So, it's great um, pleasure. I turn to you and ask you for your remarks. Mr. Osloban, thank you for the kind words. Uh, Danube Institution, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. It's uh, an honor to be here in such an distinguished noble circle. Um, I'm going to talk about two main points and some final remarks at the end. Uh, first about the long road to the possible um, uh, assumable third grand coalition under Chancellor Merkel and then some actual, actual challenges. Um, if we take a look on uh, German domestic political situation, uh, which to some may look quite chaotic, we can state that uh, everything was way more easier in the old times. Um, in general, um, at German elections, after the results pop up on the screen uh, following the election, we all know what kind of coalition uh, we are going to have and which, what kind of coalition will run the country in the next four years. Uh, by the last election, 2017, uh, this was clearly not the case. Uh, the two uh, big people parties, the Conservative Union and the Social Democrats, uh, as we already heard from uh, Professor Schley, got 14% less uh, of votes uh, in compared with the last election, uh, 2013. Further, uh, two parties are in the parliament, one of the far right and one on the far left, uh, the AfD and the, the left, the so-called Linke, uh, with a combined result of 20% with whom any coalition is impossible and will remain, uh, in my point of view, impossible in the future. Um, the coalition talks of Jamaica Alliance uh, failed due to particul particular interest of, uh, of the Liberals. I think it was more of a party strategy of, of Mr. Lindner and um, what he mentioned that there was a lack of uh, positive atmosphere. I, I think it was more like an excuse than, than, a, than a real explanation. I think he wanted to reinvent the party um, in his own kind of way. He's uh, making a one-man one show in the last two or three years. So uh, I think he just wanted to reshape the party uh, to, his own, to his own face. So um, after this failed uh, negotiation attempt, because they were not real uh, negotiations, uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, left with no more option but to turn back to the good old uh, partner to the Social Democrats. Um, considering the reluctance of uh, the SPD leadership, um, uh, just think about Martin Schulz's uh, statement following the election that he is not going to uh, lead his party uh, to a third grand coalition under Chancellor Merkel. He stated also that he's not going to be a minister um, in, in, the, in the possible new uh, uh, grand coalition. I think it's sort of a miracle that uh, the people, the big people parties managed uh, to draft a coalition treaty at all. Many commentators and analysts uh, complained about the lack of vision uh, and, about, and about the lack of mood between uh, the future uh, possible coalition partners during the negotiation phase. But if you think about it that initially uh, one of the parties did not want to govern with the other one, it is the Conservative Union Party, and the other one, other one did not want to govern at all. I believe we should not wonder about the lack of vision and passion. If we would get a third uh, GAN coalition under Chancellor Merkel, it would be an alliance of coercion, which lacks vision and passion, but works professionally, uh, fueled by a lot of money thanks to the robustus um, budget surplus uh, of the latest years. Um, if the Grand Coalition can carry on governing, it would be, in my point of view, an extended continuation of the current political course with some new agendas and with some new priorities. I'm just going to name uh, uh, two or three of them, but we can, we can add later on during the discussion. One is the welfare measures. Uh, secure the net value of the pensions till 2025. But the interesting point comes now because uh, the baby boom generation is going to retire after this deadline. So what's up then? It's just the kick the can off the road uh, and nothing, nothing more in my point of view. More, invest in, more investment in, into ed education, healthcare, are going to be some tax cuts. Uh, uh, the solidarity contribution from 2021. 
Uh, one important capital of the coalition treaty is the first one, the, the, the Europe, capital Europe. Um, the grand coalition would like uh, to have more cooperation uh, on migration, defense, just think about PESCO, higher contribution to the next MFF, uh, the multi-annual financial framework, and there will be maybe some, some new shapes uh, of the current European stability mechanism to turn it to a new uh, monet European Monetary Fund. Question marks remain, uh, um, although, uh, what's, what's about the future of the Bank Union? Uh, how about the separate parliament, the separate budget, and the separate financial minister to the Eurozone, which was in the plans of uh, President, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron? Uh, so, I would say it's, it's the, the document is really, really vague on several issues. It, it lacks uh, concrete steps and concrete uh, sentences. Um, so we will see what comes. Um, but in my understanding, the coalition treaty can be, uh, uh, can be evaluated as an aim to neutralize the challenges which are posed by the radical populist uh, uh, on the right wing, on the AFD. More state-led investment, more investment into education, and more control in immigration and refugee politics. This would be the answer of the possible third grand coalition uh, to the rise of the AFD. Now about some ex actual challenges, which is the second point. Uh, in the SPD, we, uh, the Social Democrats, we uh, faced with some turbulent times. Uh, the document is on the table, the coalition treaty, uh, but the job is not finished yet, uh, as the party members have to approve the document, but it is very hard to predict the outcome uh, of the membership vote. Uh, just consider that only in this year 24,000 people entered into the party, and the vast majority of them are uh, because of the successful campaign of the uh, leader of the Young uh, Socialist, Kevin Kunat and who is against the whole deal. Uh, he doesn't want uh, the, a grand coalition, no GroKo, it's the name of his campaign. Um, and uh, further, uh, the sudden step down of uh, the party leader and top neg negotiator during the coalition uh, negotiations, Martin Schulz, raises some very serious questions and uh, led, to, uh, led to a chaos within the party. So, the outcome of the member, membership vote is, is unpredictable. But the CDU is not satisfied as well. Um, we see a um, lot of people moaning in the, in the conservative uh, camp uh, because as a result of the coalition poker, uh, Chancellor Merkel sort of gave away to very serious uh, ministries, the finance and the interior. Um, the finance uh, ministry is... Uh, well, the Foreign Office was in, in SPD hand in the last four years as well, so... Um, but there's no rule for that. Um, I'm just talking about the, the two ministries yeah, which owned by, uh, by the Union parties in the previous phase. Yeah, but uh, the Foreign Ministry as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, Ministry of Finance, I think that's the, that's the big cut. Uh, and that's the, that's the harsh one, but... Um, Anyone uh, who assumes that uh, possible future uh, German Minister of Finance, former mayor of Hamburg, Olaf Scholz, is going to act like sort of, um, I don't know, Teutonic Varoufakis uh, with a lot of social benefits and, and uh, higher tax, I think uh, doesn't know uh, how Olaf Scholz thinks. He's more like in the right wing of, of the party with a... Um, He's in favor of, of uh, solid finances and, and not very famous of uh, uh, giving away the money. Um, and of course, go back to the CDU, uh, the question of the Merkel legacy uh, and the selection of the successor uh, will define the upcoming years. Um, but uh, at least we have a, a, a satisfied third party, the Bavarians, the CSU, uh, who can who they were able to um, uh, make really, uh, um, how should I say, uh, um, good, uh, good politics uh, and good negotiation strategy towards restricting uh, refugee policy. And uh, they got the Ministry of Interior as well. So um, at least they are satisfied. 
So, uh, coming to my final remarks, uh, normally the precondition of a stable government uh, is that the Chancellery and the Ministry of Finance is led by the same party, which is not going to be the case. Uh, we have seen uh, during the Grand Coalition year 2005-2009 that uh, it was not the case because the Chancellery was run under Angela Merkel and uh, Pierre Steinbrück was the uh, ministry of, Minister of, of Finance. Uh, they were able to uh, make a good phase uh, uh, and a good uh, successful politics together. We will see yeah, if it's going to be the case in the future. Uh, the assumable future coalition could be a coalition of small steps. Due to its fragility, I think Chancellor Angela Merkel will not strain it uh, with some policies it cannot digest. Uh, to maintain the unity of uh, Germany's future government will be, the mo will be the priority. That's from my end. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And let me just ask you one question addressed very much to your final remarks. Um, if, if this is going to be a coalition that really makes, takes only what we call baby steps in the English-speaking world. Um, what does this mean for European policy, for the relationship with Emmanuel Macron, and for what have been um, you know, quite dramatic possible moves uh, towards greater European integration, mm -hmm. particularly in the fiscal area? Yeah. Um, I think Berlin has to answer uh, to, the, uh, to the new um, uh, solutions or, or uh, plans uh, which are coming from, from Paris just because uh, that the French alternative of Emmanuel Macron is not attractive to Germany at all. Um, if, he, if Emmanuel Macron goes home uh, with, with empty hands, I think it would uh, strengthen uh, the, the opposition of, uh, of, uh, the, of the en marche. Uh, I think um, Madame Le Pen is, uh, is going to be a disastrous scenario uh, for, for Germany on the European agenda. Thus, I, have, I think uh, Berlin has to, has to agree, and at some levels, at, at some points at least, uh, which are not too, uh, too expensive. Migration is, is one, uh, the common military uh, strategy, uh, and some, some minor finance, uh, finance cooperation. But plans about the future um, parliament to the Eurozone finance minister, I'm not very certain. Thank you. Perhaps I can ask the same question to both the other speakers, with the impact of this election on Europe and European policy. Weak chancellor and the weak government is not good for, for, for to make big plans. And um, I mean, uh, in that possible cooperation uh, uh, with uh, France and uh, the, react the reaction on, on Macron's plans uh, will be not uh, as generous um, as it was probably predicted by, by some uh, analysts. Um, I mean, uh, to simplify a little bit uh, the question, um, I mean, um, the idea of, uh, of uh, Emmanuel Macron is uh, how to dream uh, a great European uh, dream financed by the German taxpayers. Uh, and the German taxpayers will be not ready to finance the dreams of Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and I think it's more and more clear for the, for the Ger German politicians too. So if, if you look at the question from um, a French perspective, from a French angle, um, I think it's, it's quite obvious and pretty clear that um, Emmanuel Macron has his mission and this is a French mission. Um, it's also um, very good that his aim is very clear that he wants to bring uh, Europe forward, closer together and overcome uh, the, the current difficulties and splits. I think Franco-German cooperation has never been in the past uh, cooperation under the terms ruled out by one partner. Um, by the way, we, we see that now um, when we look at the current state of the Social Democrats after having imposed so uh, many 
hard nuts on the other side, uh, this is never a good starting point for a flourishing partnership. I need not recall Trianon or Versailles. We all see what happened after um, some kind of diktat Frieden. Uh, so coming back to the Franco-German uh, partnership, I think there is no alternative to that. Um, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fully in line with uh, what has been said so far that Germany has now bring something to the table. Um, um, we are not quite clear um, on our answer, so that we have to um, uh, think about that and um, also negotiate between social democrats and Christian democrats. Um, but I, I would be pretty sure that there will be um, a consistent and forward-looking answer to, to that. I don't see an alternative to Franco-German cooperation when we will have to overcome all the difficulties in, in, in Europe. And uh, I see so when we look at the situation in the Balkans, when we look at the situation in Turkey, when we look at Brexit. the current crisis in Russia, Ukraine, all the challenges, I think we cannot simply, we cannot afford the current weak state of Europe. Uh, also, we need... Uh, we, need, we need Hungary and we need your leadership in, in the region. And I think we should, we should take that, the current uh, challenge, as a fresh starting point for bringing together the, the forces which are forward-oriented and which are aiming at overcoming the current situations. I think the, the, the current weakness of the European Union and the state of Europe uh, cannot be afforded. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I totally agree with that, and uh, that's, not, that's not the question, but, uh, um, and it's of course the only one, uh, that's the only one uh, very much diplomatic uh, and political approach uh, to that question. But uh, I, wis I witnessed the reaction of, um, of uh, some colleagues in the uh, German finance ministry um, just after the great speech of uh, Emmanuel Macron. And that was not so much enthusiastic. So, I mean, uh, everybody is, uh, for, it, it's, it's very much clear for, for every leader in Europe that we need a kind of, um, of, of vision for the future of Europe. But uh, if you go into the details, that comes uh, always back to the question, how to explain that to my own taxpayers? And, uh, and it makes uh, visions uh, sometimes more uh, realistic and, and uh, less visionary. But, no, go but ahead. If I may say, we should not leave the fate of Europe in the hands of pettifogging uh, civil servants in uh, in Brussels or in uh, national capitals. Okay. And when you look at the ingredients of political leadership, political leadership is always composed of the capacity to overcome difficulties and to um, overcome opposition. The uh, Franco-German Treaty, on the Alice Treaty of the 22nd of January 1963 has led to a fierce debate in the German Bundestag and um, uh, after some time, a preambula was imposed to that treaty by, uh, um, if I may say, some tendencies in the German Bundestag. And Adenauer and de Gaulle were deeply dissatisfied with that situation. De Gaulle even made his famous statement uh, about uh, the longevity of uh, treaties. So I think we should take that as an incentive and we should take these voices which you um, correctly recall um, as an incentive to overcome and to move forward. Gentlemen, I couldn't help but notice, um, particularly, Professor, when you were uh, listing all of the problems that Europe needs to solve, that there was one word which wasn't mentioned by any of you, and that word, uh, and once upon a time it would have been the first or second word you said, and that was America. There is no mention of an American role in this. Now, of course, European integration, among other things, was a 
policy of the United States State Department really consistently from about 48, 1948 onwards, and sometimes aggressively pursued against the wishes of, among other people, you know, the British government. But, but the fact is, you don't seem to have factored in America at all. And I wondered whether, first of all, why? Secondly, whether you're justified in whatever you, you reply to that? And thirdly, doesn't the speech that Trump made and recent developments within the administration, the speech he made in Warsaw, suggest that there might be some more possibility of a creative American role than we might have thought six months ago? Um, perhaps I could begin with you, Gurgley, and we'll go across this. I mean, the, the problem Trump is caused by the Bavarian state administration 130 years ago. You know the story that uh, the grand-grandfather uh, of Donald Trump went first to the United States and then he wanted to come back uh, to Bavaria, but it was refused. Uh, to accept him, to, so he had to go back to the United States. So that's the short story of the family Trump in the United States. Um, but um, I think uh, the, the U.S. politics and the American behavior uh, gives more self-consciousness self uh, for, for European politics. and. Uh, it's not bad. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, for, the, for the American political system, the, the key relation Europe uh, remains uh, still very much important. So it's of course uh, a problem. Brexit is a, is a, is a very important issue uh, in that because it, was a, it will be a missing link. Um, but still, um, I think the, the transatlantic uh, orientation of the European leaders and this, uh, this, this permanent interest uh, uh, of the US to be present in Europe and to maintain this, uh, uh, this cultural and political link uh, to the European uh, powers, it, 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 it remains um, uh, still very much important. Um, there is a debate on the future role of the United States. Uh, our current Foreign Secretary, Sigmar Gabriel, most recently made uh, um, um, a statement. He called for Germany to reconceive its strategic posture as we can no longer rely on American leadership. I, I wouldn't go as far as that. I think we desperately need strong United States of America, um, and I understand the American patience with, impatience with uh, us Europeans, and I, I, it's my firm conviction that only um, Europe can only have a bright future when uh, Europe and America are working closely together. <coughs> that has many aspects of security. If you look at the current debate on NATO's future and on um, on PASCO and other other issues, but I think that also means that we Europeans um, have to bring more to the table, and to bring more to the table um, means more bang for the buck, and that we have to um, have our eggs together. Um, but German-American relations, I think Germany is facing with something uh, she hasn't done uh, during the Second World War. Namely, it needs an American strategy. I think it's the first time that uh, Europe and Germany, you can't hear me? Yeah, it's better? Okay. Uh, that, uh, yeah, Germany has to uh, come up with a, with a US strategy. Um, but I think we should uh, look under the surface of the word of tweets and uh, just, yeah, uh, look at the tendencies and, uh, and on strategies uh, of uh, coming from Washington, uh, from the Pentagon, for instance, uh, that America is strengthening the eastern flank of the NATO. I think it's uh, really, um, it's a commitment which is undoubted. Uh, further, the United States is uh, the number one export partners of, uh, of Germany. Uh, so I think and any question about uh, to cut the transatlantic ties uh, just doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, we have to uh, 
discuss about our further rule uh, in the transatlantic relations. And I think uh, not only the German uh, uh, taxpayers and, the, and the, the German politics in general, but uh, in Europe uh, uh, as well. Um, within the NATO, we have to discuss uh, our contribution uh, to about 2%, uh, because it's, it's really a harsh point uh, of, of President Trump. Uh, and it's a just point. Um, it's another, uh, it's another dilemma, yeah, how uh, democracies uh, are not willing to uh, spend on defense, uh, s uh, that defense uh, 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 in general, uh, in, if, if we, uh, yeah, uh, if they were just, yeah, way too, um, how should I say, uh, way too com comfortable with the U.S. guaranteed security, if securities uh, after the Second World War, uh, now we, uh, have to have to open our uh, our uh, yeah, purses. Oh, wallets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now let me throw open the questions to the floor. Is, um, um, is the, yes, the gentleman right at the back, Nicholas Parsons. Uh, I don't belong to any organisation whatsoever. Um, I listened with great interest and respect to the uh, contributions from the speakers, and I was thinking as they were speaking that there was quietly an elephant in the room that threatened to break the furniture, burst the windows, and possibly trample over the august audience. And the elephant is the IFD. The IFD is now the third largest party in the Bundestag. And uh, the policy of what the Germans call Ausgrenzen has been tried before. Uh, it was tried in Austria over a number of years, and as we all know, it has failed. And it seems to me quite simply so that the reason for the limbo state of the negotiations and everything is simply that nobody will admit the possibility uh, or the allowability of forming the natural government that would otherwise be formed, which is a coalition between uh, the probably the, CD, uh, the Union and the IFD. We actually have such a coalition in Austria, where I live, and because they've finally overcome the taboo on it. Uh, and the second quick point is that I've been following the news uh, from Germany quite closely, and the problem with the SPD uh, bases voting on this government has met with constitutional objections, which I would invite the speakers to comment on, namely that it's frequently said that Germany is a representative democracy and that if you uh, delegate the decision as to whether or not this government should go ahead to uh, the 400,000 members of the SPD who are about 0.5 of the electorate, uh, you are in fact indulging in something that is unconstitutional because in a representative democracy, those who have already been elected decide on what government should be formed. And as a coda to that problem, I should point out that we have experience in England of uh, infiltration, which is exactly what I think uh, Thomas Malna mentioned has happened with the SPD, where you sign up members for a specific purpose who may even after, after that leave the party. And this has been quite a well-publicized phenomenon uh, so they uh, will then uh, infiltrate and control the party. This has happened with the Labour Party in Britain with something called momentum. And it's almost exactly the same as what they are trying to do with the SPD in Germany. I wonder if anyone would comment on the constitutional aspects of that. Well, there are two questions there. Perhaps we can give you okay. um, Well, the, the, the constitutional objections are not new. We discussed that already the last time when we had a similar situation in 2013. Um, I, I, I do understand your point and from a legal point of view I would uh, share your constitutional objections but I don't expect that the German um, constitutional court um, will uh, follow that um, uh, will follow that the, the, the point. In other words, I think the um, the situation that you have parties under Article 21 of the German constitutional uh, law they participate uh, 
in the formulation is wirken am politischen Willensbildungsprozess um, mit. I think we rely on, on, on parties and uh, the question is, it's an interesting question, but I think it will not lead to a revolution in constitutional affairs in Germany. So I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to say or make the prediction that the decision of the German Constitutional Court will lead to a totally new situation. Um, on AFD and the um, situation in Austria, I think you can't compare the AFD to the Freiheitliche in, in Austria. Um, um, the uh, Freiheitliche, have, they do have another tradition. Um, uh, they participated in several governments. So far, even um, on the, the lender level, the AFD never participated in any kind of government. And I would not recommend any political party in Germany to form a government with the AFD so far. Uh, that might look different. You can never foresee how a party will develop. We had several... Um, several experiences with radical parties from the right, uh, die Republikaner in the 1980s, um, um, and even uh, some other parties um, before that period. And after some period of time, they faded away. I don't expect the same phenomenon this time, because the AFD takes profit from what we have discussed so far from dissatisfaction and from shifts in the party in, in the party system. But my my guess is or my, my prediction is they, that they are still far away from uh, the ability to form a government. If you look at the different wings and uh, the ongoing disputes um, and, and, and unclear points in, 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 in the party system, I think there is still a long way to go. First, the new members question. Um, if you remember in 2013, there was also a um, big wave of uh, new members coming to the party. Not so big what, what we are facing now, but uh, it was uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same procedure as well. And uh, if you just look at the records, 90% of them are still in the party. So um, I do, do understand that uh, the, some, some politics of the young socialists, uh, they also had a, a campaign slogan with a, with a 10 against uh, the, the grand coalition. It means like the 10 is the, the 10 euro mark, 10 euro, it's the contribution for two months. So if you pay the 10 euro, then, uh, then you can go out and then vote against the, the grand coalition. But the numbers are just not uh, supporting this uh, the statement. Uh, on the constitutional problems, um, I'm not a legal expert, but as uh, far as I'm concerned, Karlsruhe already uh, gave the green line uh, to the SPD vote and uh, gave the green light in four years uh, before as well. Um, and the political theory, yeah, about the, the representative democracy and 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 the, and the how, what way, and what way is is it a is it a principal problem? Uh, I understand the point. Uh, that's, that's how the SPD ticks. That's, uh, they really want to go to the basis. Uh, and if Karlsruhe has nothing against, then uh, I think we should be fine with it. And um, the AfD and uh, the future possible coalition with the Union, uh, just like it happened in Austria, I think the, uh, the, the success of the AfD, that they, that they made politics against Merkel, uh, it's a union party, uh, a CDU with Merkel, is just not able to form any kind of uh, coalition uh, uh, with, with the AfD in the, in the near future. We will see what will happen in, in, uh, in four years, but in the current state, in the current circumstances, it's just not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yeah, thank you. My name is Anders Ticani, and uh, thank you, John, for bringing up the issue of transatlantic relationship. Exactly, I wanted to to, to ask the panelists about that. Uh, I remember when when the core of uh, diplomats in the State Department dealing with European issues were, were German speakers, so that they spoke old German or Russian. Uh, now that great generation of American diplomats. Uh, who actually worked uh, around the unification of Germany, 
is leaving us. Uh, it's not a career path anymore in the US to the, the Europe, de dealing with the Middle East, Iran, and other hotspots around the world. So, so the best and brightest are missing. And, and I think the same is, is true for Germany. But some, uh, some brain power would be needed on, on both sides to, to keep this relationship together. And my question is, uh, when the US is kind of working on a, on a semi-Cold War posture with Russia, uh, where is the place of Germany? How would Germany uh, kind of weather the, uh, the changes, the eventual changes of the Trump or the Putin administration so as to keep European interests uh, uh, in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to start, Mr. Mollo? I would like to press it, yeah, if it's okay. possible. <laughs> that would be a tragedy for Germany, that scenario, because uh, the German-Russian relations are so strong and the German economic interests in Russia are so strong that uh, that kind of political conflict uh, that would be a, a big, big prob problem uh, for the German economy. So um, because of that, uh, I think uh, Germany will do everything to, to counterbalance uh, this tendency and to, to try uh, to play a stabilizing role as uh, it did uh, before in the Ukraine conflict uh, and soon and soon uh, to keep this, uh, this situation uh, far away from the Cold War uh, <coughs> scenario. No, no, no more on that. Okay, thank you. The gentleman there and then the lady next. Frank Spengler from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. I will try to put my statement into a question later on, but first of all, I would like to agree with Gergi, um, really, that we are, in a certain way, not a revolutionary country. We have a democratic, cooperative form of governing. And in a larger sense, also the next government will be a minority government because except of the AFD, all other parties are in government via the second chamber and via the federal states. So you need a very, very pragmatic leader. And this talent, I think, is one of the outstanding ones from, from Mrs. Merkel. She managed to keep the whole thing working together. And that is why also on international fora she is active, because she's pragmatic and she can find deals where others have a, a problem. So my question would be, what? will happen to Germany if we have a Germany first leader. Um, and my second, uh, my second statement, uh, I'm, I'm disagree with the fact that you said that the Christian Democratic Union is not back to the Christian roots. I think quite the contrary. We have never been so near to the churches in Germany than now, in the, like in the last years, to the Catholic and to the Protestant. Why? Because if you the German CDU has three roots. One is conservative, Christian social, and liberal. And the Christian element in the last years was the most important one. I mean, look at the refugee question. There's no other country who's given so much aid, like Germany, and so on and so on. The cons end of conscription army. And can, can, can tell you a lot of other issues which we come very near to the Christian demands in our society. Maybe we are missing a bit the conservative element, and in particular, personalities who represent this element in the party. I can, we can discuss that. But I don't think we, we are on the wrong way, quite the, the other way around. I think we need maybe to rebalance a bit the roots and the strength of, of the Christian Democrats. Could, could I just, um, it's a very interesting point indeed. May I just throw a question back at you? Could amplify it further. I, I think what your description struck me as absolutely right. But at the same time, the Christian churches in recent years in all of Western Europe have been moving leftwards. I mean, uh, that is by conventional political categories. And, and uh, particularly on the refugee question, for example, um, they were, would have been um, on the left side of the spectrum. Um, but 
um, th isn't there a clash, therefore, a tension between a party which, in its electorate, is largely conservative, um, and which, uh, in adopting policies which are increasingly influenced by what is a very powerful ideological current of Christian leftism? Well, I cannot speak for the churches, but let's, I can speak for the Christian Democrats. And we get a lot of impact, a lot of motivation from the Christian belief. Social market economy is based on the social teaching of, of the churches. And so on and so on. So we always look for, for our ideology uh, strength uh, towards uh, Christianity. And uh, your question has the churches turned to the left? I don't know. And I, I, I would not be able to answer that. But I believe that the society in Germany has maybe, it's a bit more polar, polarized than po uh, compared to the past. And we see that in many other countries. And now we also see that in the results of our election. And maybe the Christian Democrats are not any more able to cover such a broad spectrum of the society li like we did in the past. And that's why we have the RFD. So that's why I say we have to maybe rebalance a bit our program. Uh, but this is due to the fact that we have to be pragmatic. I mean, uh, let's be honest, most of the criticism in the last years didn't come from the opposition in parliament, in the Bundestag. It came <laughs> from part of my party. Mm. Yeah? And still, uh, we could gather, I, mean, I think we could govern uh, in a quite uh, interesting, successful way because the economic situation in Germany is perfect. Yes. Mm. Nobody discussed that. We always go back to the hidden risks and hidden challenges, globalization, digitalization, and so on and so on. But we never dealt with the economic success of our party, for example. Well, perhaps you have just proposed the next topic for a conference that we should hold here, because I do think this is an extremely important area you've, you've raised. Thank you. Um, may, I, may I react yes. short? Um, I would agree what you have said concerning the, the, the Christian um, the Christian background uh, of the Chancellor's politics in the in the refugee uh, crisis, because I think, uh, contrary to the to the Hungarian perception uh, of Angela Merkel's uh, uh, politics, it's not just a kind of self-destroying uh, instinct instinct uh, to to have so many refugees uh, in uh, in Germany, but it is. It has a very strong uh, uh, religious or, or or cultural background in the in the Christian uh, social thinking, the Christliche Sozialere, uh, which is very much typical, especially for the German Protestants. And if you look at the German political landscape, it's it's really very interesting because uh, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, this phenomenon is still uh, present that the, uh, that the um, uh, traditionally Protestant parts of the country are more social democratic and the traditionally more Catholic parts of the country are more uh, Christian democratic. So uh, it shows that this traditional line in the German politics uh, is still present. But uh, my point was that um, um, the phenomenon Merkel you know all that, uh, to be divorced, without children, uh, a wife uh, from, uh, from the East. It not, it's not that kind uh, traditional uh, Christian, German Christian uh, democratic uh, uh, Rhineland-based uh, uh, thinking, which was very well known uh, since Konrad Adenauer and uh, which was uh, a very important point uh, in the Kohl uh, era too. So there is still some change in that, uh, um, in that, in, in, in that political thinking. And your, your other question is also very interesting because to have a German politician who says uh, Germany first, that could be that could be a, a, a worldwide scandal. That's true, but I mean that's also a German tradition to 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 packaging the German interests. 
to, to uh, represent German interests that way that we speak about European interests, but uh, we think about German in interests uh, uh, behind. And the German influence in the European politics are still, um, I mean, uh, very important. And um, uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's not bad. It's not bad, but uh, we shouldn't do so that, uh, that uh, the German uh, interests are not present at all um, uh, in the European uh, argumentation. Thank you, yes. If, if I may, one quick remark. I think the last part of the discussion is a fascinating, um, a fascinating part, and it clearly shows the dilemma in which we find ourselves. What has been debated so far um, is, um, is what, what is at stake and what the expectations are. The question is, and that brings me to the current mess of the party system, is that political leadership, uh, political parliaments, political parties cannot satisfy um, and give answers to all the questions which we discuss, and these questions stem from the current stage of globalization. We have to find answers. And even the question addressed on the transatlantic relationship has to be seen against that uh, background. So um, if you can't give the right answers to the problems, uh, then the, the um, piece of advice is lower your expectations. And I think the mismatch between expectations and what political leadership parliamentary systems can do in giving response to the challenges is one of the reasons why we are uh, why we find ourselves in such a deep mess then the question of the um, which has been addressed by Frank Spengler um, of the real political leader who gives answers yes we know the type um, um, Erdogan um, even Putin uh, this is the, the model, but it's not the solution if you look at the current mess in, in Turkey. And when you look at the future prospects of Turkey, then uh, Turkish economy is in decline, and um, I think they will see much more problems in the future. Um, we Germans um, have had our experience with um, the dear leader, uh, and um, I can assure you that there is no, no, um, no wish for someone who says Germany first, am deutschen Wesen soll die Welt genesen. I think um, we have had that experience, and it, it should la last for the next uh, at least five centuries. Uh, so um, uh, even the other side can be a problem. Foreign Secretary Joschka Fischer once said, Germany has no national interest, but only European interest. Um, I think it's good to make such a statement. The problem is that no one in Europe uh, believes in such a statement. And then the question is, what is your hidden, what is your hidden agenda? So um, the main um, solution is about communication, is about convictions. And um, uh, it's about what I call um, lower your expectations. Can I just uh, raise the, the name of Helmut Kohl here? Because it seems to me that on the one hand, he was pursuing very much a Western agenda and very much um, an agenda of, um, uh, of a, a, an alliance agenda uh, um, rather than a, a narrow national agenda. Um, but he was, of course, an extremely effective leader. He provided... Um, Germany uh, and uh, Germany's Western allies um, with a strong policy of, which included cooperation. So, in a sense, when you, you know, cite Erdogan, uh, I agree with you. I mean, uh, his, it's not simply, it's not his str strength uh, of leadership which makes him a bad leader. It's the fact that he's pursuing an extremely atavistic and foolish policy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and at the same time, you can't, can you dispense entirely with strong leadership in a society which, as you said, has got a lot of people who really are, are very unhappy and worried about what's going to happen and probably needs at least the comfort that there is some strong, intelligent person who will pursue um, a, a, a policy which develops their, protects their interests at the very least. So there was a last question by the young lady, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, I, we haven't got to her, yes. Thank you. She may not be the last questioner. Um, thank you so much for the interesting debate. Um, I present myself, my name is Emeni Mahrez. I'm first year PhD student at Doctoral School of Political Science at Corvinus University of Budapest. And um, um, drawing on already the points that you mentioned on the current political situation uh, going on in Germany now, uh, but also looking at the past events where uh, Angela Merkel have been, um, has been a, a chancellor and uh, had already uh, three terms uh, as a chancellor and going through the fourth one. Um, looking at all the domestic issues she had to tackle, um, the transatlantic relations she built and uh, during crisis and without the crisis, let, let's say the crisis, the, when the migrant crisis, for example, occurred, she was flying to Turkey, to Russia, to trying to find deals. And she was addressing her people, addressing the internal party conflicts that happened between CSU, C C D CDU, um, and trying to find arrangements and deals. She has been pragmatic, basically, let's say, throughout her, uh, most of her terms, uh, trying to find this consensus that you already mentioned. And, um, and as you said, that she, despite the turmoil, I would say she has been successful somehow in finding consensus and finding compromises and always trying to find like deals and partners to support her, uh, whether with Francois Hollande before or Emmanuel Macron right now. She's, um, for me, she has been always that uh, pragmatic leader. She had her own way of doing politics, um, also saying that she has, she's a Protestant. She, she's not from the traditional CDU. Um, uh, she did not have those traditional elements of the CDU party um, coming from a different field. Um, and thinking that Germany, uh, is a stable country economically, politically, and despite the turmoil, would remain a stable country, a stable people. Uh, would you think that Germany would remain Germany without Angela Merkel, uh, knowing that she won't have a fifth term, as she mentioned uh, during the last, um, her last few um, press conferences and interviews with this political situation? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, well, Gurgley, let's begin this one. Yes, I think Germany will remain Germany without Angela Merkel. So Germany is more than Angela Merkel. And um, I think it's, uh, um, a very, I, can, I can just repeat myself, it's a very stable system. Uh, and uh, uh, very well uh, in, in an economy in a very good shape. Uh, the state budget is uh, since years uh, uh, also in a very good shape. So, um, I mean, uh, even under a FDP or a uh, SPD chancellor or a chancellor who doesn't belong to any party, it can be a very uh, healthy and a very well developed country. Thank you. Yes. Well, well, Angela Merkel has been tremendously successful by listening, getting the facts right. Um, um, but the question is whether her wait and see method is still the right method to deal with the current, uh, the current situation. Uh, but certainly, yes, Germany will remain Germany, and I think it's one of the uh, ingredients of the parliamentary systems that uh, you are in charge only for a certain amount of time. Um, the question is now whether German society, German, the German political society, the parties, the political parties, but also economy and, and society as a whole um, can deal, and I'm sure that they will deal with the current challenges we have. Couldn't agree more. Germany will be Germany, but the question is what will happen to the CDU and not to, to Germany in general. Um, if uh, we look at Merkel's character, yeah, she as a jongleur, yeah, uh, having 
five to six balls uh, on the in the air, and then, uh, she, as you mentioned, yeah, having deals with Putin and uh, with, the, with the American president, the French president, and uh, on the European level as well. But the question is, yeah, uh, this party has opened that much, yeah, more like to the left, the successor, yeah, whoever it will be. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, they can step in Merkel's shoes in the, on the party system. Germany will be okay, but the party, I'm not that sure. Thank you. Um, now, another question from the floor. Thank you. Uh, my question would be, what are the implications for the relations to Hungary, the current situation in Germany, and uh, uh, maybe a brief outlook? Thank you. Thank you. And perhaps for the benefit of the internet audience, I should repeat what you said, that you're the Austrian ambassador to Hungary. So. Welcome and thank you for coming. Um, right, let's uh, uh, begin with um, you, uh, if you could. Well, I mean, not in an official capacity. I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the relationship between our two countries. Um, um, for a diplomat or for an advisor or for everyone else, it's always a good situation when um, there is much on the plate. I think uh, we should advance uh, in spite of any um, turmoils in the um, formation of a government process, we should continue with our daily workload and we should try to improve the relationship between our two countries. And I, I do have many ideas how we can bring forward the relationship. I think we strongly need Hungary and we need a firm and substantial Hungarian contribution to the process of European integrations. And I'm, if I may put it that way, I'm not so happy about some aspects of debates in Brussels and elsewhere. Um, and I can, only, I can only say that the firm commitment of Hungary uh, towards Europe is key and we will work into that direction. Thank you. Um, So first of all, I think we we shall overcome this um, this um, very bad times of uh, extreme political communication. I've mentioned before this chancellor debate, and uh, I could quote some um, Hungarian declarations to uh, towards Germany and especially uh, to the German chancellor is just the surface and it's really uh, a phenomenon uh, which we can explain with that extreme political communication uh, nowadays in both countries we have to be frank uh, but uh, if we, if we look um, to the roots of this uh, relationship if we look um, at um, the, the, the economic uh, uh, relations, the cultural uh, links uh, between the two countries, or uh, in also in some very important, not much symbolic, but still very important uh, European issues, uh, like uh, the Maastricht criteria, for instance, which are important for, for all of us. I think there are not many countries uh, in in Europe which are in line uh, with the with the German ideas uh, concerning that, and uh, Hungary belongs definitely the, to to those few countries. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there is a there is a big responsibility responsibility by all those. Uh, who are not uh, in the front line uh, of, uh, of politics, uh, civic or civil organizations, uh, universities, uh, probably museums, uh, um, um, to, be, to be very clear about the strategic character of the German-Hungarian uh, relations. And uh, about the, the future government, uh, I think, um, it's a very good news uh, for Hungary that uh, Martin Schulz will not be foreign minister. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, because it's a, it's a very long story in the relationship uh, of Martin Schulz uh, uh, and Hungary, 
it, uh, we loved him always, yes. Uh, it goes back uh, to the end of the first uh, Orban government, uh, European Parliament, uh, Visegrad cooperation, um, uh, Banish decrees, and so on, and so on. So that was a very, um, 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 so, uh, interesting relationship uh, between Martin Schulz uh, uh, and Hungary, and uh, that we we will have hopefully a less ideological um, uh, foreign minister um, in Germany. That's a very important uh, impact uh, for the German-Hungarian relations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a really complex situation. I'm just a greenhorn compared to the gentlemen's here. Um, um, so, uh, but norm if the relations are stuck, uh, normally there are two things that you can do. You either overstress it or negligate it completely. I think the later happened to the Hungary and German relations in the last two to three years. Um, I believe that we should put more effort on focusing on the common agendas because there are a lot. We just heard uh, a couple of it and try to do uh, something about uh, this uh, really, really problematic uh, migration thingy. I think that would be, uh, that would be better for, uh, beneficial for, for everyone. And if it's somehow solved, I don't know the, 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 the key to this, to, the, to this problem, but I think that's, that's, uh, that would be uh, the solution for uh, on the short run, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we're coming to the end. We should finish in. I'll take one more question. That wasn't a question, it was an answer. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, could I thank you on behalf, uh, the speaker's behalf of you?